Bonjour, hi to everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. On behalf of the Quebec Community Groups Network, I wish to thank the many community organizations and individuals joining us this morning to raise the alarm about the far-reaching and unacceptable impacts of Bill 96, not just on English-speaking Quebecers, but on all Quebecers. As you can see on your screens, dozens of leaders from multiple regions and multiple sectors are with us today. Tout d'abord, permettez-moi de dire que nous sommes de fiers Québécois, fermement engagés à faire la promotion de l'utilisation du français. En fait, nous sommes des alliés de nos amis et nos, de nos voisins francophones dans la lutte visant à protéger la langue française, tant à l'intérieur qu'à l'extérieur du Québec. But that is not what Bill 96 is about. As with Bill 21, Bill 96 calls for the most sweeping use of human rights overrides in the history of Quebec and Canada, ousting the application of both the Quebec Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms and the Canadian Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms. The fundamental human rights and freedoms of all Quebecers are being cast aside by this government, which will have unprecedented and unchecked power to implement the Charter of the French Language. Quebecers will be at the mercy of the Minister of the French Language with no recourse to the courts. When inspectors from L'Office Québécoise de la Langue Française shows up to seize your cell phone, your computer, and other equipment, fine your business, and dictate what language you can speak and where, we will be powerless. Depuis le dépôt du projet de loi 96, il y a de cela plus d'un an, nous demandons au gouvernement d'expliquer pourquoi la protection et la prom promotion de la langue française imposent la création d'une zone où la charte ne s'appliquera pas. Cette mesure exagérée a une incidence considérable sur l'ensemble des Québécois et non seulement sur les Québécois d'expression anglaise. Bill 96 would have significant negative impacts on commerce, employment, education, access to public services, and the operation of our legal system. These impacts were made abundantly clear during parallel public hearings sponsored by the QCGN at the National Assembly hearings last fall and in the media. Many individuals and groups called for serious revisions to the bill. Among others, they include Le Conseil du Patronat du Québec, the Montreal Economic Institute, the Fédération des Cégep, the Quebec Writers' Federation, the Commission des droits de la personne et des droits de la je jeunesse, the Barreau du Québec, Quebec Bar Association, and the Lord Reading Law Society, as well as the Coalition for Quality Health and Social Services. Not only have our voices fallen on deaf ears, but new measures introduced by the Coalition Avenir Québec during the recent Clause by Clause review have made the bill even more harsh. Qu'il s'agisse du gel des inscriptions au cégep anglophone ou de faire interdire aux municipalités bilingues de conclure des contrats en anglais, nos institutions seront assujetties à un nombre plus élevé de restrictions. En conséquence, il sera encore plus difficile pour les Québécois d'expression anglaise, d'être servi dans leur langue. As you listen to today's presentations, I would like you to keep in mind key questions we have been asking Premier François Legault and Language Minister Simon Jolin Barrett for almost a year. These vital questions remain unanswered. First, why is Quebec so intent on preemptively overriding the Quebec and Canadian charters of, hum of rights and freedoms? This will set aside our proud tradition of protecting human rights 
as well as international human rights standards to which Quebec has bound itself. Why? Secondly, why does Bill 96 further restrict, further limit access for our community to health, to education, social services, and the courts? Moreover, how does restricting services for English-speaking Quebecers protect and promote the French language? And thirdly and finally, why is Quebec adding a number of new and draconian powers to the Charter of the French language? This includes new search and monitoring powers that are exempt from the prohibition on unreasonable search and seizure in our Canadian and Quebec charters. Why? We're still waiting for the government to answer those questions. Le projet de loi 96 devrait porter sur nos valeurs, ainsi que sur le Québec et le Canada dans lesquels nous voulons vivre. Le gouvernement du Québec propose de redéfinir divers aspects de la société, le contrat social qui a été conclu entre les Québécois au fil de nombreuses décennies antérieures, la relation entre le Québec et le Canada, et même la relation existante entre les citoyens et l'État. Cet aspect du, du projet de loi devrait préoccuper chacun de nous. Tous les Québécois méritent que, que l'on réponde à leurs questions. I'd like to now go to our other speakers. Our first speaker, well-known human rights lawyer, Maître Julius Gray, will focus on the constitutional amendment, the preemptive use of the notwithstanding clause, and access to justice. Julius, the, the micro is yours. Uh, merci, Marlene. Uh, set, uh... Euh, une tâche euh, très difficile de résumer tout cela en cinq minutes, mais je vais faire de mon mieux. D'abord, je veux dire que l'épanouissement, l'amélioration euh, de, de la qualité du français, la, la vie en français sont des choses très importantes pour moi. Mais je ne vois rien dans la loi 96 euh, qui a pour effet d'améliorer euh, ou, ou de protéger le français. Il y a par contre des dispositions qui sont manifestement dangereuses pour les libertés publiques de tout le monde. Uh, first, I'll speak of the constitutional amendment. I think it's probably invalid because it's not just a, a provincial institution amendment, uh, but its purpose is surely to make the charter less effective in Quebec than everywhere else, to make the protections, public law protections of the Canadian constitution weaker in Quebec. It's difficult to see who will gain from this, why that should be done, and why uh, uh, this element of extreme uncertainty should be introduced into uh, our constitutional law. Si on parle de la clause non obstant, c'est pas la première fois. Il y a également l'exemple de la loi 21, la loi sur la laïcité. Il semble que le gouvernement du Québec pense que la Charte des droits et des libertés canadiennes, québécoises, sont des simples suggestions. S'il n'est pas incommode, faisons ça. Mais s'il y a quelque chose d'important, s'il y a quelque chose, euh, auquel, euh, 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 des choses auxquelles le gouvernement tient, euh, la Charte euh, n'a pas d'importance. Euh, C'est très dangereux. C'est également une, euh, un accro à la liberté de tout le monde. Euh, parce que, n'oublions pas, la révision judiciaire a été historiquement euh, la façon de protéger euh, les libertés. The excesses of the Duplessis government with respect to, uh, to Jehovah's Witnesses uh, or the anti-communist uh, campaign, uh, the padlock law, uh, the prohibition of abortion, the criminalization or the inequality uh, of people who were, uh, belong to the uh, gay community were all things that were solved by the courts. There is no doubt that a government like the present, Mr. Duplessis, would have used the notwithstanding clause to make sure that uh, uh, his view of a Catholic Quebec or an anti-communist Quebec uh, was protected by eliminating the judicial review 
What this government is doing is basically saying the charter doesn't matter. The charter takes second place to our policies. And then, of course, there is the very serious problem of the rule of law uh, and the access to justice. Just as the uh, uh, restrictions on the use of the charter reduce the possibility of contesting, so the justice parts of the new law prevent citizens from going to court and having an equal shot at protecting their rights. Marlene has already pointed out the uh, uh, terrible situation of uh, having inspectors come in without any recourse to the, char uh, to the charter, to powers against search and seizure and so on. And let's look at it in terms of proportionality. Quand la police est en train d'enquêter sur un meurtre, qui est une chose très importante, ils ne peuvent cependant pas saisir, entrer, euh, violer les, les, les droits euh, à la vie privée. Mais pour quelque chose qui semble-t-il est plus grave que le meurtre pour le gouvernement du Québec maintenant, pour le fait que les gens n'utilisent pas le français comme ils pensent qu'ils devraient être utilisés, ils peuvent tout faire sans recours à la charte. Toute règle de proportion tombe. Le meurtre, oui, se protéger, mais l'utilisation de l'anglais ou d'une autre langue n'est pas protégée par les règles contre les saisies et, et les fouilles. Euh, c'est absurde, euh, c'est injuste. Uh, the rules about uh, using English in court are probably invalid. They are, I'm almost certainly going to fall. Nevertheless, they constitute a serious attempt to reduce the possibility of large numbers of citizens contesting uh, their rights. There are other aspects to them. This law gets in between the lawyer and his client, uh, solicitor client privilege. The Supreme Court has already said that that is one of the most important relationships in Canadian constitutional law. All of a sudden, the use of language is more important. The contract has to be entrenched. Uh, they can verify whether the law firm is working sufficiently in French. Once again, the policy of the day is more important than the fundamental rights which have stood the test of time. So it seems to me that in one foul swoop, and uh, two perhaps, including Bill 21, the government is trying to undo the protection that hundreds of years of jurisprudence have given citizens protection against discrimination, against uh, state violence, against abuse of power. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the uh, entire constitutional notwithstanding clause and rule of law part of this bill has no place. Une remarque finale. Dans toutes ces parties de la loi 96, il n'y a rien qui va profiter à qui que ce soit. On ne peut pas trouver un seul citoyen québécois qui aura profité de ces changements, de la nouvelle constitution, de l'utilisation de la clause non obstante contre d'autres citoyens, euh, de, euh, de la restriction de l'accès à la justice. Il n'y a absolument aucun gain pour les francophones, anglophones, allophones, qui que ce soit. Les droits individuels sont bafoués et c'est tout. Merci. Thanks, Julius. Now I would like to introduce Aki Chitikov from Yes Employment and Ent Entrepreneurship to say a few words about how Bill 96 will make it more challenging to do business in our province. Over to you, Ati. Thank you, uh, Marlene. Uh, QCGN, thank you for organizing this important panel. It, it's a pleasure to be a part of it. And uh, salutations to my distinguished fellow panelists. These are important conversations that we are having, and I'm glad to be a part of it. Um, so uh, I am Aki Chitakov. Uh, as Marlene mentioned, I'm the executive director of Yes Employment and Entrepreneurship. 
Uh, you might have uh, known uh, us as Yes Montreal, but uh, we've up, uh, up, upgraded, updated our, our logo and our, uh, and, and our name to better reflect the very broad range of services that we provide to the English speaking community. So for the purposes of this discussion this morning, I'm going to focus specifically on the challenges faced by English speaking job seekers and aspiring entrepreneurs, but we can go on. There, there, there are so many other um, issues uh, in the, in the la on the landscape of employment and business development in Quebec that, that we could address, but uh, for the purposes of uh, you know, the time limitations, I will focus on, on these, two, um, these two categories of, uh, of, of people. So who is YES? YES Yes is the only dedicated English service provider for job seekers, entrepreneurs, and artists in Quebec. YES ensures retention of the English-speaking community of Quebec by providing timely, responsive, and accessible services, connecting English-speaking Quebecers with the tools needed for economic integration. Our services are tailored to job seekers, entrepreneurs, and artists. They include individual and group employment counseling and business coaching, day and evening professional and skills development workshops, special events such as the Business Skills for Creative Souls annual artist conference, networking building opportunities, access to mentorship through an innovative online platform and online e-learning strategies. Most of our services are, are free and we serve people of all ages. Since our founding, we have served over 57,000 individuals. Our services are open to English-speaking Quebecers across Quebec. YES a été fondé en 1995 par des leaders dans notre communauté préoccupés par l'exode des jeunes anglophones à cause des tensions linguistiques et les incertitudes engendrées par le dernier référendum. Presque 50% des Québécois et Québécoises d'expression anglaise qui avaient l'anglais comme leur langue maternelle nés au Québec et qui vivaient ici en 1971 ont émigré ailleurs au Canada dans les 30 ans suivants. Chez les jeunes anglophones qui pensent quitter le Québec, ils citent les compétences linguistiques inadéquates et par conséquent des options d'emploi limitées comme facteur clé dans leurs décisions. The reality is, even before Bill 96, we are still seeing too many of our clients, up to 30%, that don't stay here. Too many English speakers, especially younger job seekers, self-select and take themselves out of applying for jobs that ask for bilingualism or knowledge of French, even when they have strong French skills. They simply lack confidence. To them, Bill 96 drives the point home that the language bar has now been raised beyond their reach. This aggravates our community's economic problems. For example, English-speaking Quebecers already experience higher levels of unemployment than French-speaking Quebecers. And that is even more pronounced among young English-speaking Quebecers. 78% of English-speaking Quebecers, although bilingual, and although um, have a, a capacity uh, to, uh, to do interviews and to, uh, to, and to function in French, they still uh, have significant unemployment levels that are much higher than their fellow citizens. The rate of unemployment among English-speaking Quebecers is 2% higher than it is for French-speaking uh, Quebecers. And moreover, English-speaking Quebecers earn $2,700 less than their Francophone counterparts. And all of these disparities are even more pronounced when we look at the English-speaking communities in the regions where we know that in 15 out of 17 Quebec regions, the English speaking community has higher unemployment rates. And unemployment is even more, um, more of a challenge among youth. French speaking youth unemployment in Quebec is at 11.9%. English speaking youth unemployment is 16.3%. And for visible minority community youth, the numbers are even higher. In, in, for example, and just to give you one very you know, uh, compelling example, that the unemployment rate for English-speaking youth in the Gaspésie Ile de la Madeleine is 30%. Ultimement, on trouve que l'impact le plus marquant de la loi, c'est la dévalorisation du bilinguisme et même le multilinguisme des Québécois, Québécoises d'expression anglaise. Les chances sont grandes que ces chercheurs d'emploi qui tireront le Québec pour trouver des emplois plus payants ailleurs ou même accéder aux emplois virtuels de partout au monde. Cela entraînera une perte de talent significatif pour le Québec. Potentiellement, il décou découragera aussi les employeurs 
d'offrir plus des opportunités d'apprentissage en milieu de travail pour les postulants anglophones afin qu'ils puissent améliorer leur français pour le travail. So this is an example where francisization, we recognize here's an opportunity you know, for the government to, uh, to, to, to take a, an, a, an incentive approach as opposed to a coercive approach by uh, providing French language training for all Quebec adults. Now, let me talk about the impact on small and medium businesses and, and entrepreneurs. Last year, YES helped over 700 aspiring entrepreneurs from every imaginable sector to launch their small businesses. Entrepreneurship is not easy and demands discipline and efficiency. Like in every other endeavor, the small English speaking businessman in Quebec has to do more, more work to promote their business, to access the necessary funding, connect to the right networks and navigate the Quebec government business and tax bureaucracies. And like all entrepreneurs, the English speaking entrepreneur needs a sensible regulatory network. We know from the Canadian Federation of Independent Business and from other you know, business authorities that Quebec small business owners are opposed to Bill 96 regulatory requirements. They report that, the, that red tape in Quebec already costs more than $8 billion a year and lost economic productivity. The surveys that they have done of their members on Bill 96, this is, the, uh, this is what we hear from, from small uh, business people and aspiring entrepreneurs. 56% des petites entreprises au Québec s'opposent aux mesures de francisation que euh, la loi propose. 61% de, des entreprises de la ville de Québec et 60% des entreprises de Montréal s'opposent à ces mesures aussi. C'est déjà assez difficile et compliqué pour les, 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 les petites entreprises et les entrepreneurs de mettre en place le bon système pour la comptabilité, pour le marketing, pour le service de paie, pour les ressources humaines. Maintenant, d'exiger aussi là qu'ils euh, mettent en place des comités de francisation, ça c'est vraiment, c'est un fardeau euh, supplémentaire et quelque chose qui qui fait aucune contribution à leur succès. In another telling uh, Canadian Federation of Independent Business Survey, They surveyed 781 of their members last year and found the vast majority, 65% of, resp of respondents, say that it is essential that English uh, be a part of business operations. Then there's the reality of Montreal's vibrant tech startup sector. There are 1,300 tech startups in Montreal. They have staff working from all over the world. How are these firms going to be able to work in French when English is the working language of these international teams? What is the logic of tying small Quebec businesses to burdensome regulations that restrict their hiring options when these same businesses never needed more flexibility in attracting talent in a severe labor shortage environment? Again, we hear from our friends in the business community. 64% of Quebec small businesses can't get all the staff that they need. This is the highest proportion anywhere in Canada. There are, at the last count, there are 238,000 positions still left unfilled in Quebec in the third quarter of 2021. And we know that that, that rate keeps rising uh, daily. Conclusion, in conclusion, we interpret Bill 96 as officially shutting down any English path, pathway for non-Francophone job seekers, entrepreneurs, and artists to gain a foothold in Quebec society. Fundamentally, we are in the people and talent business and measures that create obstacles for talented, motivated English speakers to fulfill their potential are not good for our collective success. We go back to making it easier for our kids and newcomers to set up shop, a shop anywhere but here in Quebec. Why are we doing that? Thank you. Thank you, Ati. Aki, sorry. Now I, I would like to invite Dan Lamoureux the president of the Quebec English School Boards Association, and Nancy Beatty, a director of Constituent College at Champlain in Lennoxville, to address the devastating impacts of Bill 96 will have on our English-speaking, English-language CGEPs and our college-level students. Over to you, Dan and Nancy. Thank you very much, Marlene. I am here on behalf of the Quebec English School Boards Association, who represents the nine English school boards across Quebec. While there are many issues surrounding Bill 96 for our entire community, 
including the blanket use of notwithstanding clause, I will speak to the new three-year cap on temporary stays of foreign nationals. The original charter of the French language had a disposition that anyone coming to Quebec, to work in Quebec, excuse me, from another country was able to obtain admissibility to English public schooling in Quebec for three years with the option to renew. This new cap has removed the option to renew any admissibility after the initial three years. The number of students and families availing themselves to this option equals on average a minor 3%, which has absolutely no effect on either the French or English systems in the long run. We maintain that there is absolutely no reason to amend the temporary stays for foreign nationals that would cap the eligibility certificate to three years. A pointed example of implementing this new provision, we may not have seen the United States Vice Pres President Kamala Harris spend six years and graduate from Westmount High School when her mother, Dr. Harris, a breast cancer scientist originally from India, brought Harris and her sister, Maya, to Montreal in the 1970s when she took a job teaching at McGill University and doing research at the Jewish General Hospital. This talented researcher might not have accepted this position if told her children could not benefit from a bilingual education in Quebec. This is simply one example of the talent that Quebec will ultimately lose if this is adopted in its current form. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. So I guess it's my turn. Good morning, bonjour. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of a relatively small English language CEGEP outside of Montreal. Um, and I know our voice hasn't often been heard, but I think it's important that you hear that in its current form, Bill 96 would be detrimental to our students, to all the English colleges, to our communities and to Quebec as a whole. This proposed legislation will hamper English CEGEP's abilities to meet the needs of our students and the regions we serve. This approach delivers a resoundingly negative message specifically to the English speaking communities and to our youth. Cela c'est pas une question de manque de volonté d'apprendre le français. Depuis des décennies, la communauté d'expression anglaise a demandé à maintes reprises pour avoir accès à la francisation, à des cours de français dans le seconde. Mais ça a été une demande qui a jamais été répondue au niveau provincial. Ce, ce projet de loi qui cible entre autres nos CGF n'est pas la bonne réponse. Bill 96 puts student success at clear risk. Over the last two years, the Ministry of Higher Education has placed tremendous emphasis on improving student success at the college level. First semester pass rates, retention rates, and graduation rates are all high on their priority list. The imposition of three program-specific core courses in French with English CGEPs within English CGEPs will have a dire impact on the success of a significant portion of our student population. These courses would be imposed in addition to the two already mandatory French second language courses that students must pass to graduate from an English language CEGE. All of a sudden, a student will be thrust into a context of learning psychology, physics, accounting, counseling techniques, or other core program competencies in French. Under no circumstances is this a sound pedagogical approach. And we estimate that between 30 and 50% of our student population may face serious risk to their success because of it. Such a student will be a risk of course failures, of a negative impact on the critical R score upon which admission to university is assessed, and ultimately throws into doubt whether they will be able to graduate with a college education in Quebec. Changing the rules of the game as students are well on their way through an existing educational system is patently unfair to them and sets them up for failure. What does a student face as a choice? Well, a student who's been studying in English throughout elementary and high school is all of a sudden faced with wondering, do they even bother attempting college with this new barrier? Is the government deliberately setting them up to fail? Do they leave the province? Do their parents decide to pack up and move elsewhere in support of their educational aspirations? And what about our students who require accommodations? For example, those with learning disabilities or other specific needs. Impact on these students has not been considered at all in this context. Now, we often refer to French as the second language in English language CEGEPs, but for a portion of our student population, our Indigenous students, French is often the third language. 
the success of this particular student population has been completely disregarded with this proposed legislation. Bill 96 casts a large shadow over the future of English CEJAPs. The, through the imposition of network-wide limits on the relative weight of the English colleges and caps on our enrollments, the bill creates an effective long-term strangulation of the English language CEJAPs throughout the province. The English colleges will be forbidden to increase student numbers, even when demographics would dictate otherwise, much less have the ability to add new programs to respond to the needs of our local region and to the labor market shortages. And of course, it completely disregards the international business context where knowledge of the English language is essential. Finally, the Bill 96 amendments have not taken into consideration any aspects around implementation. There has been no thought about the necessary human resources required to teach any new courses with mandatory delivery in French, or even about the potential job losses that may transpire because of these changes, much less have the significant complexities involving changing program structure, competency alignment, language of instruction, and preparing students for a different exit exam been even thought about. En conclusion, ce n'est pas trop tard de faire des ajustements significatifs au projet de loi pour changer le, le message adressé à la communauté d'expression anglaise, pour soutenir l'apprentissage du langue français de une façon positive et constructive, et de laisser le choix de langue d'études postsecondaires au choix pour les citoyennes et citoyens du Québec. Merci. Thank you, Nancy and Dan. I would now like to in, invite Côte Saint-Luc Maire Mitchell Brownstein to discuss the negative aspects of Bill 96 on municipalities that have official bilingual status. Mitchell, over to you. Thank you, Marlene, and for all the panelists that are here today, and our guests, and particularly the media who we count on to get out our message. You know, we heard from Julius Gray today, a constitutional law expert, and so many other panelists about the unprecedented overreach of Bill 96, about the future we are about to enter into in Quebec if this law is enacted. That future will include language inspectors seizing computers from business owners without a police warrant. That future will include civil servants reprimanded by their employer for using English words in an email message. That future will include cities like ours having government grants stripped away from us at the whim of the all powerful French language minister who isn't happy with how many jobs require knowledge of English in our city. There will also be a requirement to contract in French only without an English version having any authority in law. Further, cities will have to ask for legal opinions or other professional advice only in French, even when the mayor and all the councillors are English, when the outside lawyer is English and the other party is English. Je suis le maire d'une ville dont la population est majoritairement anglophone, ce qui est une exception au Québec. Mais Côte Saint-Luc est encore plus intéressant que cela. Si vous descendez une rue, vous pouvez entendre un groupe de personnes discuter dans une combination d'anglais, de français et d'italien. D'ailleurs, on peut entendre de français et de russe. Et dans un autre coin, on peut entendre de l'anglais avec un peu de yiddish. Des langues sont belles. I understand why French-speaking Quebecers will always be concerned by the use of French in Quebec, and I understand why some language laws might be necessary to mitigate the natural attraction of English because we live in North America. Ce que j'aimerais que le premier ministre Legault et ses ministres comprendre c'est que le genre des changements radicaux qui contient le projet de loi 96 fera mal aux familles québécoises. Ils nuiront à la capacité de certaines Québécoises de trouver un emploi. Il va presque certainement décourager de nombreuses personnes de créer des entreprises. Il y aura des effets réels pour tous les Québécoises. Pas seulement les Québécois anglophones. Merci. Thank you, Mitchell. Finally, I would like to invite my fellow QCGN board member, Dr. Sandra K. de la Ronde, to discuss the limiting effects 
that Bill 96 would have on our access to health and social services in English and on positive outcomes for patients who are not fluent in French. Sandra, over to you. Oui, merci, uh, Marlene. Et bienvenue à tous et tous qui uh, nous joignent pour aujourd'hui. Uh, Bill 96 has defined or has pro is providing a definition of a historic Anglo. Plus que 5000 uh, personnes et 50 groupes nous ont joindre à QCGN pour protester contre, contre cette définition. C'est quoi un historic Anglo? A historic Anglo, according to the bill, is somebody who has received education at the elementary and uh, secondary levels, uh, but no else, nowhere else. How will this be determined? How will a client of health and social services in Quebec be uh, asked to prove this when they ask for service in English? Are we going to be issued a registration card? This is offensive. Currently, health and social services in the province is governed by section 15 of the Act respecting health and social services and states that individuals can receive services in English where resources, personnel, and financial capabilities are available. An amendment to Bill 96 excludes Section 15 from the revised charter, charter but a review of, of this suggests, of the bill suggests that it will supersede all other uh, legislation. And in fact, certain areas, uh, including the communication with RAMQ, uh, will probably be in French only. Uh, the provincial government has uh, <clears throat> disbanded the Provincial Access Committee, which gathered access plans from regions like where I live in the Bas Saint Laurent. Uh, and these plans were created uh, under law to uh, define, assess, and, and recommend access to services for English-speaking people in the um, various regions. These plans now sit in limbo. Quebec with Bill 96 is going backward against decades of research that shows that provincial provision of culturally sensitive care, including, uh, including language that the user can uh, understand improves health outcomes. There is the issue of safety. How does a patient give informed consent to care when they can neither understand the, the description of the care that they are going to receive or the forms that they are asked to sign when they are going to have received care? How do they use medications or follow treatment plans when they can't understand either of these? Imagine the scenario of an elderly English speaking gentleman with dementia who is in a care home that is not designated bilingual, um, who has a unilingual uh, French caregiver uh, and is having a bath where the water is too hot and he is scalded. Or imagine the suicidal teenager who cannot communicate with a unilingual French counselor for her fears and her thoughts. And as has been mentioned before by uh, Professor Julius and others, there is the issue of confidentiality. It is inherent in the relationship between a caregiver, specifically physicians, but others, and a patient that all communications are confidential. What happens when somebody complains that a patient and a physician are communicating in English and the Office of the Language uh, Regulation comes in? Their files are seized, are seized and uh, information that is theirs alone um, is seen by somebody that has no right to this info. There are many other examples of barriers to care in uh, this bill that will block 
uh, the delivery of safe care to uh, the English speaking population and other impl implications in terms of uh, attracting uh, world leaders in medical and science care and social services. Um, if they uh, cannot speak French or if their children cannot go to school in French, uh, there are blockages to hiring, to even advertising for bilingual caregivers. Um, the list goes on, but I hope that we have let you know what the impact will be on healthcare for the population. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Your examples of the potential impacts of Bill 96 are quite compelling. And I also want to thank our lineup of community leaders who have outlined their considerable concerns about Bill 96. As you can see, and as you have heard, this proposed legislation is littered with destructive measures that will have direct and grave impacts on the rights of English speaking Quebecers and on our community's vitality. Left unchanged, this bill would radically alter the future of our community, our province, and our country. Enfin, j'aimerais rappeler le fait que les institutions gouvernementales ce qui inclut la fonction publique et les emplois des fon de fonctionnaires comme tous les emplois occupés dans des in institutions relevantes du gouvernement comme les hôpitaux et les écoles ne pourront plus exiger le bilinguisme sans, sauf dans des circonstances exceptionnelles. Cela signifie que le bilinguisme tant pour les anglophones que pour les francophones, ne serait plus considéré comme une compétence professionnelle utile. Minister Jolin Barrett stated last February that his goal was to protect and promote French and that the English-speaking community and our institutions would be protected. While he continues to push that refrain, it is clear that the Bill 96 will have long-term negative impacts on individual English-speaking Quebecers on our healthcare, our education, and other institutions, and on our community organizations. Once again, we urge the government to set aside this proposed legislation. We remain convinced there are more effective and inclusive ways to protect and promote the French language than those outlined in Bill 96. This bill simply does not reflect the modern inclusive Quebec that members our, uh, of our community have helped build. And rest assured that QCGN, our members, and our multiple community stakeholders will continue to speak out against Bill 96. We know it's going to be brought back to the National Assembly around the middle of May, and we hope the government takes that opportunity to pass major amendments. In fact, given the seriousness of this and our preoccupations, the QCGN and our partner organizations are planning a public demonstration for May 14th here in Montreal. We urge you and all your family and friends to join us in this very public expression of our dissatisfaction with Bill 96. For that, stay tuned for the details. And I thank everyone and turn it over to our Director of Communications to field the question period from the uh, media. Good morning, thank you. So um, I indicated in the chat uh, for media only, um, please indicate if you have a question to ask and we will unmute you and, uh, and you can set forward your question. Or raise your virtual hand. Oh, I guess we were really complete and really clear. I, I have a question, but I don't know how to raise my hand. Okay, go ahead. Who is Andrew. this? Sorry, Andrew, where? Jason Magda with the Montreal Gazette. Okay, Jason, hi. Hello. 
Uh, so ahead. thank you for taking my question. Um, it, it's, uh, I guess it's simple. There's a group uh, all opposed to, to Bill 96 here today. Uh, we've been told that there is going to be some sort of action, a public action, a very public action. Can we get a little more, a few more details? And, um, and then I have a follow-up question. Yes, of course. Um, as I stated at the very end of my remarks, QCGN and many of the community stakeholder organizations that are here today are organizing a public demonstration Saturday, May the 14th. We will provide more details as to where it's going to start and where it's going to end, but um, we're looking forward to this public expression of our dissatisfaction and concern about this. I mean, Premier Legault has said, I haven't heard any real opposition. Well, we're hoping that our community and all Quebecers who are profoundly concerned with Bill 96, all of the restrictions it has created or will create, and the fact that it evacuates our Quebec Charter of Rights and Freedoms, along with the Canadian Charter, will uh, raise their voices on May the 14th. Jason, you had a follow-up? Yeah, the follow-up is uh, how, how many people are you expecting and are you finding it difficult to, to um, motivate people to, to go, uh, considering this is, this is a law where essentially you have to study the clauses to really see what the impacts will be on specific communities. It's a little bit um, ephemeral, as, as, as uh, I might say. Uh, so are you expecting to see a lot of people? And if, uh, or do you think it's gonna be difficult to try to motivate people to, to come out for this? It's the reaction of our community when they've learned through the work of QCGN and all of the other member organizations, uh, the CGEPs, uh, YES, um, you name it, uh, the Quebec Home, uh, Federation of Home and Schools, the uh, Quebec uh, Association of English School Boards, you name it, the uh, Conseil du Patronat, outlining exactly what the impacts of 96 will be on their membership, then I think that there is serious awareness about how Bill 96 is going to be bad for the majority of Quebecers, not just English speaking Quebecers. And in terms of how many do we expect to see at the demonstration, I have no clue. But I can say, if I was the only one there, I would still consider it to be a success because raising our voices, yes, it's a public demonstration, but it's also sending letters to the premier. It's also the petitions table in the National Assembly where we're talking about tens of thousands of signatures, tens of thousands of letters. That's all an expression, public expression of our concern about Bill 96. So clearly Premier Legault and Minister Jolet Barrette aren't reading the petitions that have been tabled in the National Assembly, aren't reading the letters that thousands of Quebecers have sent directly to them at their offices. They're not reading any of it for them to claim there's been no public uh, rising up of voices. So uh, leading up from that, uh, we have a question in the chat from Lily Ryan, who's from the Elmer Bulletin. Um, she's asking, can we get a comment as to how much uptake there is in the French media about the risks with this bill? I might comment that there were two reporters um, from the Francophone press that signed up for today's press conference. Um, there are a dozen from the English media. Go ahead, Marlene. I think you've just said it all. Okay. Um, so now uh, we hand it over to Alison Haynes, who has a question. Can we highlight and unmute her? Hi, hi there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, so I have a, a question and, and a follow up. One is uh, the QCGN has been sounding the alarm about the more draconian aspects of uh, Bill 96 since the very beginning. And since then, things have only 
gotten worse uh, during the clause by clause. More amendments have tightened the screws. And um, I'm just wondering at this point, what hope do you realistically hold out for um, for changes? I mean, you're asking them to just set aside the bill and have been from the very beginning, but in terms of say addressing the SAGEP amendment or some of the other um, uh, amendments, uh, you know, at, at this point, what is, what is your level of hope? I would, as an eternal optimistic person, I, and uh, based on QCGN's uh, experience over the last 25 years, we never give up hope until the hammer has actually fallen and struck the stone. So as long as Bill 96 has not been proclaimed into law, we maintain hope that the government will see sense will put the actual success, for instance, of our students at the CGEP level, make that a priority as they claim to do and remove those amendments that would one cap um, uh, the number of students in the English uh, CGEPs and two, require those additional courses in French core courses rather than um, the two la second language courses. So we will always maintain hope, but be clear, I'll be clear. If the hammer strikes the stone and that piece of legislation is in fact pro proclaimed into law, then Premier Legault, this is a warning shot over your bow that there are many organizations and not just organizations representing the English speaking community, organizations representing commerce in Quebec, representing employment in Quebec, representing health and social services in Quebec that have already begun looking at legal challenges. All right, so and, we only had a, go ahead. She has oh, a follow -up. If I can just ask a quick follow-up uh, and it, it kind of dovetails with what uh, was, was asked just before me about how many French media are here, et cetera. But what about um, engaging Francophone groups uh, and whether it's the legal community or as you said, the business community, has, has there been any outreach and, and do you expect any participants from Francophone community? Well, if, if one looks at the briefs that were uh, tabled by different largely Francophone groups at the National Assembly uh, Commission's hearings, public hearings in September 2021, like the Conseil du Patronat uh, du Québec, like Le Chambre de Commerce uh, Montréal Métropolitaine, like the Federation of Independent, uh, Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses, like some of the trade unions where they pointed out their real problems with aspects of Bill 96, like the unfettered search and seizure powers of the language inspectors, like the requirements for um, legal uh, documents, contracts, everything to be in French only, and that English uh, uh, versions would have no legal standing. A lot of that came about because QCGN reached out to these organizations, provided them with our deep dive policy analysis, pointed out these sections of the law that could, the proposed law that could be really problematic for their membership. So I, I wanna pat QCGN on the back for that because that wouldn't have happened, I believe, had QCGN not done that background, re, uh, you know, reaching out. So yes, we have reached out, we continue to reach out, and we continue to um, hope that these organizations themselves will continue to speak out on behalf of their membership. So there's a follow-up question from Lily about uh, the May 14th day of action. Will there be locations outside Montreal, um, such as Gatineau or Sherbrooke? We hope so. And we're organizing 
uh, with all of our member organizations and community organizations that are not members of QCGN, but who are very active. We've been doing that background uh, groundwork. And so, yes, uh, we're hopeful that there will be demonstrations outside of Montreal as well on the okay. 14th of May, which is a Saturday. Up next, uh, John Grant, can we unmute him and uh, highlight him if possible? There he is. Hi, uh, it's uh, Josh Grant with CBC. Hi, um, so you've, it's, no, no worries. Uh, you already, um, you've spoken a lot about your concerns, um, preoccupations. Can you just summarize for me, what are your biggest concerns about Bill 96 if this does uh, come into law? The fact that it completely evacuates the role of the judiciary as one of our constitutional pillars of our democratic society. Because no matter how good a piece of legislation might be, to say that the courts will have no role at all in determining whether or not a piece of legislation is in accordance, is in conformity with our Canadian Constitution, Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and our Quebec Charter of Rights and Freedom is, is simply unacceptable. It leaves, it, it leaves the sole power in the hands of the executive in Quebec, that's the Conseil des Ministres, and the National Assembly. And Premier Legault repeatedly says, I'm governing for the majority. I'm doing what the majority wants. That to me is frightening because the charter, any charter of rights and freedoms is, is precisely to ensure that the majority doesn't run roughshod over fundamental human rights of minority. Thank you for that. And yeah, I, I, so my colleague from the Gazette sort of asked this already. But I'm curious, you, you're ready to mobilize, you're ready for legal challenges if this is passed. What about in the meantime, is there any talk about, you know, sitting down with the Liberal uh, Party of Quebec, the official opposition? Obviously, they've said they're going to maybe try and walk back the, the clause that they installed with Sejeps. They're obviously, they seem to regret uh, even putting that out there. But in the meantime, what are you, is there any sort of push uh, with political parties to try and get some modifications, to try and get some, some uh, to adopt the law before it, it's, uh, before it's passed? Adopt the law before it's. I'm. I'm not sure. I understand. Sorry. I, I, I. Is. Is there steps that you're taking to try and uh, get some modifications made to the bill as it is before it's passed? Like to. Obviously, you're with a Quebec Community Groups Network. How are you trying to maybe get the opposition parties to step up and say, "Hey, look, this is dangerous, not just for Anglophones, but for a lot of other groups in Quebec." Can you speak up? Can you try and get some modifications in this before it, it's passed and, and brought into law? Got it. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, QCGN has always done outreach with all political parties to ensure that they're very aware of um, the concerns of uh, the English speaking minority community of Quebec. So we have had uh, discussions with representatives of the uh, uh, Quebec Liberal Party, as we have had with other political parties here in Quebec. Um, to put on the table what our concerns are and um, uh, to respond to their uh, questions, to know what do we think, what does the community think on this. So that's an ongoing process. Okay, so uh, we have one more question. If you have any questions, um, put them in the chat really fast because we're about wrapping up. So finally, uh, Sophie at the Elmer Bulletin is asking, about the impact on what will this mean for high school students that are unprepared for three core courses in French when they get to Seja? I would turn that over to um, Nancy and Dan. They're our specialists in education. So I'll begin, uh, obviously it's a huge challenge and it's not to say that some students won't be able to succeed. We do know that some of our students come out of high school, you know, with very strong French language skills for a variety of reasons, but that's not the majority. For those who 
are not at that level of French. This is a huge barrier and it is tremendously unfair to change the rules of the game part way through. It's an education system. CEGEPs don't exist in a vacuum. We receive students out of the youth sector. They have been taking French second language all the way through. Um, this is really, uh, this will be very, very challenging for them and certainly put student success at risk despite the ministry, you know, endless purporting to support student success. This has nothing to do with student success for the English community. I think that uh, as part of the Quebec English School Boards, we all do a, a very good job in graduating our, our, our children in immersion in French. Uh, we, we, we were the birthplace of a French immersion uh, 55 years ago, and we're still doing a good job. Can it be better? Of course, anything can be better, but I think we, we do graduate our kids with a good level of French. This level that's being required at the at this at the college level is again is as again it's a, a huge leap in the in the capacity to speak and uh, and learn in, in that language. So it's I think we're doing a great job, and I think that uh, it's a concern that all parents have that uh, they want to make sure what's best for their children. So, uh, but I do think we do a very good job for now. Yeah. Thank you, Dan and Nancy. So. A final question to Gordon Lambie, who had his hand up, but I didn't see it. I am very sorry. So if we could unmute uh, Gordon and uh, perhaps put him on camera. Gordon from the Sherbrooke Record. Hi, thanks. Um, so just uh, noting the comment at the end or the, the call for major amendments uh, when things come back together in May uh, and sort of recognizing that this whole presentation has been about how there are a ton of issues. What are the, the priorities in a situation where you're not getting necessarily everything you ask for? Clearly, the wish of everyone is that the government remove Bill 96 and actually conduct real consultations with across the board, with all sectors. That's the wish. And the government's made it very clear. It's not listening. It's going na 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 to everyone who's saying withdraw the bill. It's a flawed bill. So in that case, different sectors have been requesting different things. So for one, in terms of education, you've heard Nancy and Dan call for the government to walk back the amendment that would require three courses at the CGEP level, three core courses be taken in French to walk that back. And if they want to add the number, minimum number of French as a second language course, go with that. They've also asked that the permanent cap on the number of students um, being allowed into English CGEPs across the province be revisited. So that's just looking at education. In terms of health and uh, social access to health and social services in English, we've heard from the experts in the field that they want a complete carve out that communication, good communication to ensure quality services to patients in the health and social services sector be at the forefront, not Bill 96. So that's a carve out. That means that Bill 96 would not apply in the health and social services sector. Um, if we take commerce, we've heard from Conseil du Patronat and other organizations that represent bis business owners, small business, medium-sized businesses, that the unfettered powers of the language police to search and seize without a judicial warrant is simply not right and unacceptable. So basically everyone's saying, take away the notwithstanding clause, and then amend these other sections. All right. Um, 
Good question, good answer. Um, we're going to wrap up now. Um, if anybody has any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to send me an email and we'll set it up. Um, I'm going to throw to our Director General, Sylvia martin Laforge, who is going to say a couple of words. Well, thank you for sticking with us until 12.10 uh, about. Um, merci d'être venu. Please stay tuned for the, the continuation of this story. Uh, the rally. Um, our partners, QCGN, is preparing for the rally on May the 14th. Um, so you've heard a little bit about it. Uh, we will have a Facebook page up. We are organizing and um, we would start at Dawson at 1030 to reach the Premier's office for 11 o'clock. And uh, once we've ar arrived at the Premier's office located across the street from Miguel Roderick Grace, we will convene for some quick speeches. But stay tuned. We will be giving you more details uh, on our Facebook page and uh, we certainly Look forward to the energy uh, that you've demonstrated here today in greater numbers on May 14th. Be well. Thank you. Bye, all.